Don't you love it when cartoons are gay? Yeah, okay, fine. Let me express myself in a more eloquent manner. In 1999, a new cartoon show premiered on Nickelodeon, known as SpongeBob SquarePants. It revolved around the life of a sponge who lived in a pineapple under the sea, getting into hijinks with his underwater pals, flipping burgers and hunting jellyfish. To say this show took the world by storm would be an understatement. It became an intrinsic part of the channel's brand, running for over 250 episodes and making a ton of money in the process. It didn't come without its share of criticism, though, as adults were concerned that the show was making their children dumber. Or... Gay! Now, it kinda goes without saying that there's nothing inherently gay about Spongebob. The character's creator stated that he has always thought of him as somewhat asexual, which technically means he is still part of the LGBTQ crowd, but he was not designed to be a gay character. The idea of Spongebob being gay comes more from outdated stereotypes of what characterizes homosexual men as opposed to straight men. Things like being interested in cooking or acting in a cheerful, almost flamboyant manner. Which, the more I try to explain, the sillier it becomes. He was labeled as gay simply because he wasn't hyper-masculine, or because he performed his masculinity in a way that was considered unusual. And the reason why this is relevant is because, for the longest time, that's as far as we got when it came to LGBTQ representation in cartoons. We were left with characters that were labeled as odd, one way or another, like a boy that acts in a way that is deemed too sweet, or a man who shows no interest in women. At most, we would get an off-screen comment on part of the creator saying that this character was, in fact, not straight, but it never came into play within the show itself. You would have the staff joke around about how two male characters would end up together, but they would never write an episode showing that happening. Gay relationships would be censored out of the main storyline, or they would be severely sidelined. That is the age of television that I grew up in. And according to my channel statistics, I guess a lot of you did too. It was only with the arrival of the 2010s that we started to see these kinds of relationships be depicted in a more relevant, canonical manner. And even then, it would take years until the characters would be able to show their true colors. Their bright, super rainbow colors. That's why I feel so happy whenever I see LGBTQ characters being portrayed in a positive and significant manner in current shows. We still have a long way to go in terms of representation, especially after decades of having these kinds of characters be rejected and sidelined, so I want to give credit where credit is due. In this video, I am going to talk about three examples of LGBTQ representation in modern cartoons, and what they did right. I want to talk about representation. Now, for the sake of time, I have picked three examples of modern cartoon shows and I believe each of them have a different lesson we can learn when it comes to depicting LGBTQ characters and issues. This is not a definitive list, and my analysis will be focused on one or two specific aspects of their storylines, so please forgive me if I don't mention a certain episode or character that you like. This is not a complete guide to gay cartoons, and there are still points to be made aside from the ones I am about to discuss. Also, just because positive representation is becoming more common in cartoon shows, it doesn't mean that the issues faced by LGBTQ people have been fully overcome, or that the real-life experiences of this community will be as positive as the ones shown in the series. Even within our list of good examples, some groups are still depicted less often than others, and we should still push for better representation, as well as real-life rights. With that said, I believe that praising the instances in which these issues have been dealt with in a tasteful and uplifting manner can help us understand more about what we can and should expect, as well as the standards that have been set and that should continue to be met and surpassed. 
Let's start off our discussion by talking about Kipo. I have already explored this Netflix series in my channel before, so I won't go into too much detail, but for context, Kipo is a series about a post-apocalyptic version of Earth in which animals have gained human-like intelligence through mutations, and the actual humans were forced to retreat underground in order to keep their communities alive. We follow the adventures of Kipo, a girl who finds herself lost above the surface after having spent most of her life living below it, and now she must find her way back to her father. Throughout her journey, she is joined by other humans, such as the unfriendly wolf and the cheerful Benson. When the series begins, Kipo is 12 years old, but she actually turns 13 about halfway through the first season. Benson insists that this is an important time that must be celebrated, so the gang splits up as Wolf tries to find a present for Kipo, and Benson takes her through a birthday journey. He brings her to an amusement park that is also a safe zone for humans, trying to show her that the surface world isn't so bad after all, and that there's still beauty and love to be found. Kipo is rather touched by this experience, as she has just spent the past week being chased down by several animal gangs, and she starts to see both the surface and Benson on a different light. And as I'm watching this, I can feel myself growing tired before anything even happens, because I've watched enough cartoon shows to know where this is gonna go. Whenever you put two characters of the opposite sex together, one is bound to have a crush on the other, and we will spend a good chunk of the series dealing with their relationship, even at times when it doesn't feel necessary. But instead, Benson just says, I'm gay. And that's that. Kipo apologizes for misreading his signals, and the plot picks up again, with them engaging in a chase sequence through the theme park, with no major drama or halts to the story. There are two things I want to point out here. One, Benson coming out to Kipo wasn't treated as some world-shattering revelation. It's actually not that big a deal. He is a little embarrassed for not being able to return her feelings, but that's just because he cares about her and doesn't want to upset her. There is no sequence of him agonizing over telling her the truth or not, or of him trying to hide that side of himself. It is a natural, nonchalant revelation that brings no trouble to the parties involved. This scene is a great example of how to normalize LGBTQ identities, showing the viewer that they don't have to be treated like something heavy. Coming out to your friends doesn't have to be filled with drama, and it's also cool to have a character who is this comfortable with his identity, and who isn't afraid of showing it. The second thing is that this revelation is not treated as a joke or a problem. Kipo gets flustered over barking up the wrong tree, but that's more on her than on Benson, and she quickly snaps out of it. Upon learning of Benson's sexuality, she immediately accepts him, and starts treating him as a friend again instead of a romantic interest, with no hard feelings whatsoever. As I have mentioned before, this interaction does not mean that every single LGBTQ person will have a similar experience when coming out to their friends, if they even choose to do so. However, it's nice to have such a positive, light-hearted depiction of this event, showing us that coming out doesn't have to end in tears, and that, like Kipo, there are cool and supportive friends to be found. For my second example, also from Netflix, I want to talk about She-Ra and the Princesses of Power. This show is a modern reboot of the 80s series. The story focuses on a world filled with magic that is being threatened by an evil group that wants to rule the power that the planet truly has. The land is protected by princesses, who can use this magic to their favor, and also by Shira, a powerful entity that can be summoned by our protagonist Adora. Listen, if you want your daily dose of positive LGBTQ representation, then Shira is the way to go. There are so many great examples of characters and scenes and storylines that to even attempt to discuss them all here would be madness. Instead, I want to focus on what I think is one of the greatest aspects of Shira's representation. 
Fair warning, I will be discussing events related to the series finale, but I'll keep my declarations and the footage vague enough so that no specific events are spoiled aside from generic descriptions. Still, if you want to remain completely spoiler-free, I recommend you skip this part. When any show comes to an end, it is almost expected that they will have some sort of conclusion regarding its main couples. Who ends up with whom, and so on and so forth. Shira does this too, showing us the endgame relationships of several characters. And two things about it are, in my opinion, absolutely fantastic. One, several of those pairings are gay. Here, I think it's important to note that LGBTQ relationships are explored throughout the entire series, but when it comes to the finale, the show goes out of its way to state which characters end up together, asserting those relationships as official. Two, while most of those gay pairings are explicitly shown to be romantic, going as far as allowing the characters to kiss on screen, which is kind of a big deal when it comes to gay characters in cartoon shows, the very few pairings that could be deemed heterosexual are only implied. The characters sure stand next to one another, and they might even smile at one another, but there's nothing explicitly romantic going on between them. At least, not on the same level as the same-sex couples. And even then, you could make the case that those straight couples aren't even straight to begin with. If you look at them through the understanding that the characters involved might be interested in people of multiple genders. And just because they don't end up in a same-sex relationship doesn't make them heterosexual. The true genius in this scenario lies in how this is the exact opposite of what usually happens. Many shows will take great care in declaring straight pairings as final and explicitly romantic while keeping any sort of same-sex relationship as merely implied. It would be just as easy to argue that those characters end up together as it would be for you to say that they're just friends. Gal pals. Just guys being dudes. The way in which Shira plays with these expectations and precedents is truly remarkable. It's subtle enough to slip under the radar, but it's just relevant enough to be noticeable if you pay attention. It's a win-win situation, and I'm really glad they got to win. The third show I wanted to talk about is actually the reason why I wanted to make this video. I'm honestly mad at how long it took for me to learn about this series, and once I did, I couldn't get over how great it was. It's about a kid, an egg, a park, they do stuff, and it's called Danger and Eggs. Out of the three cartoons I've chosen to talk about, this one is probably the least popular. It was released on Prime Video and lasted for just one season. It's also the show that requires the least amount of context, because a kid and an egg who do stuff at a park pretty much sums it up. The show follows Dee Dee Danger, the thrill-seeking child of a stuntman, and her best friend Philip, a giant talking egg who is oddly fond of safety protocols. They work really well together, with Philip ensuring that Dee Dee is properly equipped before jumping through a hoop of fire, and with Dee Dee helping Philip not take life too seriously and not be consumed by anxiety. I really gotta get a Dee Dee of my own. On the surface, there doesn't seem to be much to talk about. This show is a lot more episodic than the previous ones, though it does have its small share of continuity. The fun lies more in whatever daily hijinks the characters get themselves into, as well as the gags and the animation, rather than the plot. But if you take a closer look at it, you start to notice some recurring themes. The show constantly questions the nature of rules, wondering whether they're even worth enforcing if all they do is limit your freedom or if they're based around outdated principles that everyone either disagrees with or believe they should be re-examined. There is also the matter of gatekeeping, or deciding who does and who doesn't belong to a certain group. There are several instances where our characters need to question who gets to determine that, and who is being left out. And once they realize how arbitrary those social divisions truly are, they no longer feel like the system represents them. They explore the true value of the bonds we form and share, 
and how the concept of family isn't limited to the people you're related to. You are free to choose who your family is, and your choice should be based on the people around you who love and support you. We learn about how you shouldn't try to force people to fit into a certain image of what you think they should be, and of how your appearance shouldn't limit you from presenting yourself in a way that you wish to be seen. How you should try to leave a little room for the weird and unexpected in your life, and how accepting those concepts can make you more open and understanding. Oh, and on the last episode? They go to pride. Like, it's literally pride. They even use actual flags from the actual letters of the LGBTQ. It's freaking incredible. The most important aspect of this show is how it's able to tackle subjects and questions that are relevant to LGBTQ issues without falling into cliches, or without having to enter romantic territory, which is actually what the creators intended. Questions of rules and belonging can be seen through a variety of human perspectives, but they were deliberately used here in order to create an experience that helps us understand LGBTQ topics without needing to be heavy or obvious. The more you look at the show through this lens, the clearer it becomes how the creators were able to use its goofy settings in order to explore serious topics. LGBTQ issues go beyond the romantic spectrum. They encompass matters of equality, acceptance, and understanding. And there's no reason why a show that wishes to deal with those kinds of struggles should limit itself to dates and crushes. This is a series that has pushed the barriers of the questions that cartoons can deal with. And they did it in a way that is hilarious, lighthearted, and endearing. Through these three examples, we have explored different ways of tackling the issue of LGBTQ representation in cartoon shows, each with their own strengths. While my comments don't encompass the entire realm of possibilities of dealing with those questions, nor does it attempt to reduce the matter of representation to just these three instances, it feels refreshing to have such positive examples at our disposal. Cartoons, however, don't just magically show up on television, or streaming services, or wherever you prefer to watch them. They are a group effort that takes several months to put together, and they are a reflection of the many artists that worked on them. So, it shouldn't come as a surprise that each and every one of the shows I have mentioned were made by a crew that is filled with LGBTQ staff members ranging from writers to voice actors, all working as a team in order to bring us shows that continue to push the envelope when it comes to tackling such issues. It is by giving these people a voice that we are able to get wonderful shows like these, which will go on to educate and inspire countless others. These series are by no means defined solely by the inclusion of LGBTQ themes and characters, as they all have great stories and settings that make them stand out on their own. But those issues are still part of the show's identities, and cannot be separated from them. It is thanks to creators like these, and to the studios that give them a voice, that LGBTQ representation doesn't have to be reduced to a figure left to the sidelines, or to a pairing that is never confirmed, or to controversies regarding characters that don't perform a version of gender expression that conforms to what is considered the norm. We have come a long way in terms of representation, and we still have a long way to go. But by singing our praise to shows like these, not only learning from them, but actively fighting in the name of the voices they are trying to represent and amplify, I am certain that the list of positive examples will only continue to grow. Thank you for watching. Well, hello there. It was very nice of you to watch this video. If you have enjoyed the video, you can do those cool things such as clicking the like button, subscribing to the channel, and clicking the notification bell too. 
You can also follow me on Twitter and share this video with your friends. If you really like what I do, you should consider supporting me on Patreon. I have linked it down in the description and I highly recommend you check it out. Feel free to leave a comment down below, especially if it is about your favorite example of LGBTQ representation. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you on my next video. Bye! Also, during Pride Month, Nickelodeon made a tweet basically confirming that Spongebob is actually part of the LGBTQ community, and I'm not saying we should praise them for it, but what I am saying is ace rights, baby! <laughs>